Uh, I think America is under siege. Uh, the principalities and powers in the heavenly places that are trying to take away from God's people our freedom to worship God and the liberty that we've known for 250 years. And the heart of our church and the leadership of this church is that we would be uh, a means of keeping it from happening. So we started the series a couple weeks ago on the Ten Commandments uh, last week. Preached on the first two, and this week we're going to do commandments number three and four. So, thank you, God, for blessing the reading of your word. Uh, everybody would open up to Exodus. Yeah, I wish I could. Last week we read Deuteronomy chapter five. We're going to get it from just a slightly different point of view. But we've been learning the hand signals for the Ten Commandments as we go along here. Um, a bunch of the kids have gone. But We'll go through them as adults because I really think that people, you know, and God kind of laid this on in my heart a couple of weeks ago before we even started this series. Well, how can we expect people to live by God's <laughs> law and His commandments? How many know it's to our own good that we keep God's law? Amen? Amen. 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 It's to our own good. And we've talked about this before, but if I go out here and run down the road and I get, and I'm doing 95 miles an hour down the highway and I get in a wreck and the speed limit's only 40, how many know that Ford, that speed limit sign out there that's posted 40 miles an hour is for my good? Yes. Amen. And if I get in a wreck, whose fault is it? Yours. Exactly. Because I broke the law. And the same is true of God's law. When God gives us commandments, he's not trying to keep us from something. He's trying to get us to somewhere. But the devil perverts that in our thinking and tries to make us think or believe that God's trying to take something away from us when in all reality, God is trying to put something in our hands, something in our lives, in our relationship, in our home, in our community. God's law brings blessing. It brings provision. It brings hope and promise. Disobedience brings consequence and death. Hello? So why would we not want to uphold the law of God? Amen? So this week we're gonna we're gonna just read Exodus 20. Everybody say good morning to Dana. Good morning, Dana. Good morning. I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto thee a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So let me remember the hand signals for the Ten Commandments. First one, keep God first. You can tell who wants to do the second one. Get it up. You shall not bow down before any other God. The third one? You don't have to use God's name in vain. Yeah. So let's go through these. And, uh, let's, 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 let's do that as we go through these. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing love and kindness unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Every time I read that, I just, I, I'm blown away. God shows love and kindness to thousands. You want to make a difference in the world? Keep his commandments. I'm going to read verse 6 again. And showing love and kindness unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt, not, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 
that will not hold him guiltless, that takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. More fingers for this people. To keep it holy. Six, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. In it you shall not do any work. No. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore God blessed the seventh Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Commandment number five. Salute. Honor your mother and father, that your days on earth may be long. Honor them that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Andrea, what's number six? Thou shalt not kill. Okay. Okay, so thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. You shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Amen. So, we're going to talk about affirmation this morning a little bit before we get started. Dana, are you still there? Dana? All right, everybody say good morning to Dana. Good morning, Dana. Good morning, Dana. Okay, so how many know that when God says you shall have no other gods before me, that that's the commandment in, in a negative sense, that, that we're not having any other gods before, before me. But how many know that the positive affirmation of that commandment is that in not having any other gods before the Lord God, that we work hard to make him our only God? Amen? So it's not just a prohibition against something, it's also an admonition to something. And that's the case with all the commandments. When God says not to use the Lord's name in vain, He's not just saying not to use His name in vain. We're going to get into that because it's much deeper than what comes out of our mouth, although it starts there. But what God is saying not to use His name in vain, He's also saying that when we use our tongue, we should be using it to declare life in His glory, in His majesty. Amen? So a prohibition against something is also an admonition to something. So let's, and, and the first five are, are, are a prohibition against something. The, net, the last are, again, are the last five are a prohibition, prohibition against something. The first five are, pro, are an admonition to something. Excuse me, I'm showing my tongue this morning. Yeah, we believe the tongues around here. I've convinced everybody. It's true. <laughs> um, so when the Bible says you shall not kill, how many knows? How many know that we're supposed to go out in the life and be a resource for life? Amen? Mm -hmm. It's not just a uh, prohibition to not kill. It's an admonition to, to be a source of life. And so if you look at God's commandments in that, in that light, they, they really take on a whole new dimension. So this morning when we get, we're going to talk about using God's name in vain and what that really means. Now, if I ask somebody here this morning, what, Karen, what do you think about using God's name in vain? And how many people would agree that that's pretty much the crux of the commandment? Amen? Well, I want to present you just a slightly different perspective this morning. Although it is that. It definitely is a prohibition against using God's name in expletives or as an expletive. Amen. And the Bible says that those who do that will not go unpunished, will not be guiltless on the day of judgment. But as I got into this, and as I've dug a little deeper into the law of God, the message of the, of the law as God gave it to the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. God's really revealed some things to me that I didn't see before. And one of them is this. Uh, let's go to 2 Timothy 2.19. We're going to talk a little bit about the name of God this morning. Because the commandment says, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Now, 
we're going to focus on that word vain a little bit. Going like I didn't ready to get zapped or something that static. <laughs> Yes, Second uh, Timothy two nineteen. Can we find it? I'll be at the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal: the Lord knows them that are His. And here's the here's the part I want you to catch. And let everyone that names the name of the Lord depart from unrighteousness. Okay, so when the scripture tells us not to take the Lord's name in vain, I want, I want to challenge you this morning. How many of you call yourself a Christian? Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. How many know that to take God's name in vain is to say that you're something and then in secret to be something else? To take God's name in vain is to say that I'm a Christian and I take that holy name unto myself and live in a way that's contrary to that name. That's taking God's name in vain. And it goes much deeper than an expletive coming out of our mouths. It's about who we are. And it strikes right at the poor heart of what God is saying to us, the people not to use his name in vain. And I've seen a lot of foolishness in my life as a believer. This month, 35 years, I've known Jesus. Maybe longer. But I remember giving my heart to him on November 14th of 1980. And I lived in a vain <clears throat> way for a bunch of years. In and out of prison, in and out of addiction. Oh, I went through it. And I had repented as I got before the Lord and really began to examine what taking His name in vain means. It's much deeper. And I want to talk a little bit about the names of God this morning. Because Christ, the name of Christ reveals everything that God said about Himself in the Old Testament is revealed and fulfilled in Christ. Amen? God revealed Himself. And I, I just scribbled a few amounts for last night. Jehovah Siskinu, God our righteousness. I bet some of you in here know these. Jehovah M. Kadesh, is that right, Janice? God who sanctifies. And we know the Spirit of Christ sanctifies. Jehovah Shalom, God is my peace. Jesus said, I'm the Prince of Peace. I have come to give you peace. Jehovah Shammah, God is present. Behold, I am with you always, even in the ends of the ages. I will never leave you from sin. Jehovah Rapha, God is my healer. I may know Jesus is our great healer. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Jehovah Jireh, God is my provider. God revealed himself when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac. God is my provider. God provided for himself a sacrifice, which was Christ. Jehovah Nisai, God is our banner. Every time we look at a cross in church, we see the banner of heaven. Jehovah Rohai, God is my shepherd. Those are just a few of the names that were a foreshadowing of who Christ would be and what the Messiah would bring into the world. Just a few. In the name of God in vain, it's not just about our mouths. It's about how we live. And one thing we want to do in this church is we want to exhort people to live for God. Amen? And we don't want to be a people that, that, that people look at us and go, that's a people that are set with vanity. Because that's what the word vain means. It means to be, it means that it, to live without purpose, to live for purposes that are outside of the best that God has for us, to run a race with no design. We run toward a destiny. We run toward a goal. We run toward achievement and success in the gospel. And we don't want to take the Lord's name in vain, take his name unto ourselves, 
and then live in a way that's contrary to the gospel, that's a violation of the third commandment. It's not just about what's coming out of our mouth. It's about what's coming out of our heart. You know, we know Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You can judge a tree by its fruit. A good tree brings forth good fruit. The measure of your life and the example, the testimony of how we live is who we are in the gospel and evidence of whether or not we are taking the Lord's name in vain. Because Paul tells us in 2 Timothy that everyone who takes to himself the name of the Lord is to depart from iniquity. Different perspective on that commandment, isn't it? Totally different perspective. Living in vain. One of the things that Jesus talked most about was living in vain. Hypocrisy. He never came into the world. And my little brother was adequately pointing this out to me the other day. And I believe it's true. He never came to the world and said, Oh, you you need to quit doing you need to quit drinking. Even though we know we need to quit drinking. He never preached against any specific sin, but the two things that he preached constantly against was hypocrisy and self-righteousness. Because living in vain is to be hypocrite. To be somebody in secret that we're not in public. And who we are in secret, that's who we really are. Because when God's looking, that's what it counts. Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are open and naked unto him to whom we must give account. When God's looking at me, and I'm alone in my closet in the middle of the night, he's watching what I'm doing. When nobody, when none of the rest of you are, God knows who we are in secret. And Jesus said that that which is done in secret shall be uh, shouted from the rooftops. So if we're a holy people praying and living in piety and devotion to God, people are going to see that. They're going to see it in the marketplace. They're going to see it on our jobs. They're going to see it when we go to church. They're going to see it when we're at, uh, attending our children's events at school. They're going to see it. And they're going to be drawn to it. Because Jesus said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. But we don't lift him up by going out being a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal and talking stuff that we're not living. That's not lifting Jesus up. We lift Jesus up by living a crucified life and showing the world that we have found a better way to put to death the deeds of the body and the sinful flesh. And to live out the new, the resurrected life of Christ. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And when we fail to see what the, the, the point of the gospel is, which is to transform our lives, and, we're, and we don't make that our number one ambition, to live a transformed life, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. Because we have claimed to be something or claimed to be someone's that we're not really surrendering or rendering our lives over to. And that is the epitome of vanity. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Ezekiel 36, 22 through 28. Ezekiel's the very end, well, it's toward the end of the Old Testament, for those who don't know. <clears throat> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. <coughs> the major prophets. 26? Isaiah 36. 36. Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sermon notes. <laughs> Thank you for drawing me. That's for sure. <laughs> Isaiah 36. I mean, it's Ezekiel 36. Amos. Amos. Amos Amos has the best cookies in town. <laughs> Ezekiel 36, 22 through 28. I'm going to have to get these transcribed next week in Braille. Yeah. Okay, do you want to come with you? My love with life is so shy. I, uh, Ezekiel, I almost did <laughs> <laughs> it's real. Thus says the Lord God. I love this passage of the scripture. I love it. Thus say the Lord. 
like my ears perk up. I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name. Okay, now we're talking about the third commandment here, so let's, you might want to put in parentheses for my holy name, because the, the third commandment is not to take God's name in vain, but for my holy name. And then he says to the nation of Israel in the throes of their idolatry, which you have profaned among the nations. Ouch. Ouch. There is the heartbeat of the third commandment right there. This, this was while the children of Israel were in their 70 years of captivity. Ezekiel was a prophet that uh, was part of the, the captivity. The captivity. And so God is saying to Ezekiel, for my holy name, and my people profaned my name among the nations, wherever they went, and I will sanctify my great name, which have been profaned among the nations, which have been profaned in the midst of them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Okay, how many times is God going to say sanctify to us? Sanctify, sanctify, sanctify. I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries where, out of all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Okay, the first, second commandment is to have no idols before God. So anything that we put before God is an idol, amen? And I will cleanse you from all those idols. A new heart, verse 26, also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart. How many know that idols are made out of stone? I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes or his commandments. And you shall keep my ordinances and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. And you shall be my people. And I will be your God. So I guess it's a glimpse in Ezekiel of what it means to take his name in vain. It's to live a bad example. It's to live a bad testimony before the world. It's not just about the cuss word that comes out of our mouth, although that's part of it. But it's to live in a way that's contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ and yet claim to be a believer. That's tough stuff right there. That's at the heart of God. In fact, I have and have had for many years that passage of Scripture. I have a heart in my Bible. Two of them. Because there's just some passages that just give us a glimpse of heaven. That just give us a glimpse of the heart of God. That just reveal to us who our Father is. And this one here, God is saying, I'm going to take that stony heart out of your chest that beats with idolatry. And I'm going to put my spirit within you. And when he comes into you, he's going to sanctify you. And I'm going to write my laws on the tablets of your heart. And you're going to be commandment keepers, not commandment breakers. Covenant keepers. And you're going to be a man, a woman, a child that goes out of the world and makes a difference. Because I have made you clean from the inside out. Not, not, not somebody who profanes my name. I would have been a man that I don't even have to say anything about my faith. And I want to be a man that people just look at me and the conduct of my life, the testimony of my family, the way I spend my money, where I spend my time, who I spend my time with, how I conduct myself at work. And they just look at me and see the piety, the devotion, the loyalty dripping with the anointing of Jesus. That's really what's at the heart of the third commandment. That we are people that are just dripping with the presence of God, with the presence of Christ. And that we don't even need to open our mouths. 
because God is in us. And our lips have been anointed with life. Anointed. Now here's the prohibition. If God's taking, telling us not to use his name in vain, okay, it's definitely an admonition to have circumcised lips. Not Botox, but circumcised. <laughs> then these lips need to be rendered over to God. And how many know that if we if we if we ask God to teach me how to use my lips to speak life? that we'll never have to worry about the lesser commandments. They're not really lesser, but they're later down the list where God's telling us not to bear false witness against our brother, which is a lie. Or to live a life of deception. And we'll get into that when it's time. But if we get the first one right, how many know that the latter one will just fall into place? Amen? Because that's just the way it is in the kingdom. You get your priorities right, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added up to you. We get our priorities right, and all everything else just falls into place. It's such a simple program. It's so simple a child can understand it. Amen. I wrote this, and I'm just going to read it. Reverence, piety, devotion, respect, awe, holy fear, appreciation, hope, love, and loyalty. These are the things we should be communicating, communicating about our God. Lips that are circumcised are lips that are not only keeping the third commandment, but they are lips that teach others to love and fear a holy God. A holy God. Amen? Amen. There's much that can be said about this, uh, this commandment, and there's been... Uh, a, a grip of history, 2,000 years of church history, of debate over the Sabbath day. One of these days coming up, I will, I will teach uh, an expensive. Is that? Is it? All right, well, I'll just raise my voice. One of these days, I will teach uh, extensively on the Sabbath day. Um, it's much greater teaching than we can even begin to fight off in one service today. Uh, Joshua, when he commanded the sun to be still in the heavens, that was a glimpse of the, sh of the, of the foreshadowing. When Moses was out fighting that, was it Ammonites? Or the Amorites? I think it was Amorites. And they held up his arms. It was a picture of the cross. That's a picture of the Sabbath day. The teaching is much, much broader than we can cover here in this lesson today. But, so that we have general rules, general guidelines as to what it means to be Sabbath keepers, we're going to go through some things this morning. So we're going to start out in Hebrews chapter 4. And I will tell you, I believe with all of my heart... That God wants us to be people that keep his law to the letter, to the dot, and to the jot and tittle. I believe that. But I also believe with all my heart that the legalism that the Pharisees fell into during the time of Jesus was not of God. And it never had the breath of the law. It never had the intent of the law. They lost it. When trying to live legalistically, they lost the heartbeat of the law. Because God's law, when it was all said and done with, brought mercy and justice to the community. And during Jesus' time, that's exactly the things that were being left out of the community. The widows were being neglected. The orphans were being forsaken. People were tithing their mint cumin, but people were stealing and defrauding and doing all kinds of crazy things in the name of God. And Jesus preached emphatically against those things. To have a legalistic mind and yet be forsaking the whole intent of the law? Jesus brought his people rest. He is the Sabbath. Because we don't need to labor anymore to keep the law because none of us could. And so that, that intent of the Sabbath is to bring us to a place where we just go, thank you. <clears throat> Because the law by itself was a yoke nobody could carry except Christ. Amen? 
He's the only one that can put the cross on his shoulders and carry the burden of humanity. The only one. And when he said upon the cross, it is finished, the rest of humanity went, We entered into rest. Because in trying to keep an impossible standard that we couldn't because we were fallen sinners and had the nature of our father Adam in us, Christ, who did not have the nature of his father Adam, could keep because he had the holy righteous spirit of the living God living and breathing in him. And he and he alone could keep the law to the last iota. <clears throat> and no one else could. And so he took, that, he took that requirement to the grave with him. That is what the Sabbath means. Lock, stock, and barrel. And so we're going to get into that. Hebrews chapter 4, 1 through 9. Because the, the writer of Hebrews is telling us, you need to fear. If you miss the big picture here of what the Sabbath really means, you need to, you need to be concerned. Because at this time in the church, there were a bunch of people going through telling the, the Gentile converts and the new converts, you need to keep the Sabbath. You've got to get circumcised. You got, you can't eat pork. You, you got to do, you got to keep this festive, full moon festival. And it's not in the keeping of any of that that brings us into the kingdom of God. Because how many know the scriptures say, uh, say we are saved by grace through what? Faith. Faith. And the Bible says faith without obedience is dead. But faith comes first. Okay, and we've used this illustration before. If faith was a horse and works was the buggy, how many know people don't get on the horse or the buggy doesn't pull the horse? The horse pulls the buggy, right? When you have right faith, the buggy, which is what pulls the people or what the people get into and are pulled by faith, can get into the buggy. That's the works. But the faith is the horse. The mechanism or the machine or the, the power that comes for the works is the faith that is exhibited in the cross of Calvary. And when we have the right faith, people can get into the buggy of our church, the buggy of our Bible studies, the, Bible, the buggy of our Celebrate Recovery groups. They can get into the buggy and they can be taught the faith that they need to have. And by faith, with works that accompany our faith, we move toward the desired goal. Amen? Let's read, let's read what the author of Hebrews has to say to us. Let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into his rest. Now, we're talking about the Sabbath day, so it's a rest here, right? How many know the Sabbath is all about rest? Any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good tidings preached unto us, even also as they, speaking of the saints in the Old Testament, those probably in the captivity, but the word of hearing did not profit them because it was not united by faith with them that heard. In other words, the whole reason God gave them the law was to show them, "There's cut. you will never be able to keep my holy standard. And so every year when they went to the Passover and they sacrificed the lamb and they participated in the Passover, it was all a foreshadowing of that which was to come. It was to prepare God's people for something better. But somewhere along the line, they lost the heart of it, and they got into this rut, and with every generation, the rut got a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper until they looked like groundhogs when Jesus came along. Heads half in and half out of the ground. They were lost. They had no idea what God's intention for the law was. They completely missed the boat. And you know what? That's exactly what God wanted to happen. He wants us to see our need. Because if we don't see our need, how many know if you're going to get well, if, you are, if you're an addict, the first step of recovery is admitting you have a problem. Amen? It's no different in the kingdom. If you're a sinner and, your life is, and you're wrapped up in sin, you have to admit, I'm a sinner. I'm lost, and this thing's bigger than me, whatever it is. Because if you don't have a need, there can't be somebody who can meet that need. But when you come to a point in your life and you say, I've got a need, I really need to be healed. I really need to be whole. 
And it's the point of need that brings us to the foot of the cross where we find the solution to our, to our need. The first step is admitting that we have a need. And that was the point of the law. And there was no rest until Christ came. Because he did for us what we could never do on our own. For we who have believed, now put in parentheses, believe. Mary, you might want to underline that. For we who have believed do enter that rest. The rest comes not through keeping the commandment, although that's important. But it comes from believing. See, the whole process of God coming in, doing what he said he would do in Ezekiel doesn't happen because we want it to. It happens because He wants it to. God has to move in us and draw us into a place of obedience. John 6, 44. No man comes to the Father or comes to me unless the Father first draws him. There's an internal work of the Spirit that takes place long before we decide to get up off the couch and go, hey, I could have had a V8. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. It's God wooing us and drawing us into His presence. Drawing us into the word of truth. He's wooing us. And that's why prayer and intercession become so important in our midst. Because if we are praying for God to woo others, His hands are handcuffed. God does nothing on earth that He does not first have permission through our prayers to do. That's why when the disciples said, teach us to pray, Jesus said, pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because we are supposed to be the ones that are saying, God, whatever your will for this church is, let it be done in heaven as it is on earth. Let it be done. And that's, a, that's the consummation of the ages when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband, or as a husband, yeah, as a bride adorned for her husband. The new Jerusalem comes down and earth and heaven become one reality. That's the consummation and fulfillment of the ages when the spirit realm and that and that material or physical realm are married forever just like they were in the body of Christ. Fully God and fully man. In the end of the ages, the promise of that, the fruition of that will be Christ coming to earth and ruling for a thousand years. Amen? That's our rest. The hope that we have in that. That's our rest. That's why those people that are over there being beheaded can lay down there and they can have their heads put on the chopping block. And the last thing they say to the persecutor is, God bless you. I forgive you. Because they know what's on the other side. And they know that death and hell are the keys to hell. And death have been given to grant, granted over to Christ. And they can lay their lives down because they've entered into the rest. They know what's on the other side. They know they have life. That's the Sabbath. So, so it's not about going to church on not exclusively, Let's, and we're going to move along here. For he has said, okay, verse 3, For we who believe do enter into that rest, even as he has said, I swore, as I swore on my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, because they kept tripping over their legalism. Although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. How many know that the Bible says that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundations of the world? From the beginning of the world. When God said, let there be light, what, day one through day six, God had already knew. That's why Paul said the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament is the work of his fingertips. Because if you look at the constellations, Virgo, hello McFly, it's a slideshow in the sky. Virgo means virgin with child. Libra, the scales of God's justice. Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah. God put it all in the heavens so that every month we get another glimpse of the coming Messiah. It's all there. It's been perverted through, through the ages by demonic and cultic cultures. But from the foundations of the earth, God had already rested. He already saw the day when Jesus would say, It is finished. It is finished. Verse 4 For he had said somewhere of the seventh day, on this wise, uh, God, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works and in his place. And when I look at this and I see the life of Jesus Christ, how many of you know that he was so tired that he went to the work and there he went to, went to the ship and fell asleep in the hole of the boat in the middle of a storm 
No, I can't. I'm a pretty light sleeper, okay? I'm like Barnabas Collins. I don't sleep. I can't imagine being in the hull of a ship. <laughs> okay, that's fatigue. That's when you know you put in a long day at the office. Okay? How many know that Jesus lived every day of his life knowing that that day he would be crucified? And he fed the multitudes and he healed. The foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He labored for 33 years knowing there would come a day when God would cease from his works. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He ceased from his work. Because he knew every day of it, every single day of it, he would be striving with man, Genesis chapter 6. My spirit should not always strive with man. That he would be striving with humanity to bring the Messiah into the world. That he would be striving with us to let the Spirit of God have his way in our lives. Striving with us in our personal life not to take the Lord's name in vain. Striving. And all of it. The cross. The end result. Is finished. Mark 2 28 says that Jesus is the, the Lord of Sabbath. Verse 6 Seeing therefore it remaineth that some should enter therein to, to whom the good tidings were before preached, failed to enter in because of disobedience. He again defineth a certain day, saying, Two days, saying in David, so long a time afterward, even as it hath been said before, today, if you shall hear his voice and harden not your heart. You can harden your heart with that legalistic doctrine that you got to get to church on Saturday. Yeah, because there's people in the church that think the Sabbath, and the original Sabbath day was on Saturday. But if you do that, you're going to miss the big picture. You're going to miss the true rest because you're striving to do what the law says, and you've missed what the law provided, which was a lamb that would be crucified and slain. Harden not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them the rest, and that's what I was talking to you about, Joshua commanding the sun to be still, and this thing goes much deeper than we can talk about today. Uh, he would not have spoken afterward of another day. There's another day coming. And that other day is the day we are in now, the age of grace, the great age of rest. There remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And he that has entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works as God did from his. A couple, a couple passages real quick. Um, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. How many know it's so easy to miss the big picture? Amen? Because we're, we're human. We only see this much of it. Right? Okay? And that's good if you're a horse in the race, and we should be most of the time. Okay? Stay in your lane. Not go way in your steam. But God sees the whole picture, the end from the beginning. He sees the whole thing. And so He has a perspective that we don't. And we can miss the big picture. If we don't open our eyes and hearts to what God is really saying to us in the totality of His Word, the whole Bible, from one cover to the X, because you can take any passage of Scripture and, and apply it. You can take two passages of Scripture that says, Judas went out and hung himself, and another one over here that says, Go thou and do likewise, and we'll have a whole church full of hung men. What'd they do in Sunday school? Oh, they played hangman. Amen? If you don't properly interpret the Word of God, 
It's very easy to lose the intent of the Word of God. That's why the, commentary, the Bible is its own best commentary. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. You need to read it yourself. You need to read it yourself. Amen. That was a commercial from our friends over at Bresby. <laughs> he stands or falls. Yea, he shall be made to stand. For the Lord has power to make him stand. One man esteems one day above another, every day, and, and one sees every day alike. Let each man be fully assured or persuaded in his own mind. So am I going to hate on my brother over here who's going to Seventh-day Adventist church because he believes that that's what God would have him do? No, because in the church, Jesus said, I am the vine and there are many branches. Okay? As long as we have fellowship on the essential doctrines, we're good. We're good. It's the essential doctrines that tie us together and they give us the same spirit. we got to stop fighting over the trivial stuff because God's work is not going to get done as long as we're fragmented by the petty indifferences of humanity, the politics of Christendom. We're not going to get the job done. America's coming apart at the seams and it's time for God's people to come together and we got to stop fighting over the stupid stuff that divides us. we got to. And this is a church where we're going we're gonna to serve God in the letter of the law, but in the spirit for which it was written, in trust and rest and hope and peace and joy and patience and kindness and long-suffering. Because the Bible says of the fruit of the spirit, who can rattle those off for me real quick? Anybody? The fruit of the peace, spirit love, is... Peace, love, joy, long-suffering, patience. Goodness, temperance. Goodness, temperance. And, then, and then the last phrase of that 